with the other companies which you mentioned and the way they're helping us to achieve this. Thank you. That ends topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Fergus Ewing on Scotland's energy strategy. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. Members who wish to ask a question of the Minister might like to press their request speak button now. And I'll just give a few brief settings uh, for everybody to settle. Thank you. Uh, I now call Fergus Ewing. Minister, 10 minutes. Presiding officer, there are a few things as important as secure, affordable, sustainable energy provision that delivers the best outcome for Scotland's businesses and consumers. The Scottish Government has a well-established approach to energy, ensuring good stewardship of Scotland's oil and gas resources, whilst prioritising the long-term development of clean energy sources as part of a varied energy mix driven by some of the most stretching legislative targets for emissions reductions in the world. Today's statement is to update Parliament on the Scottish Government's plans for a new overarching energy strategy, uh, which I set out when I addressed the Chamber last September. On the 1st of March, the First Minister and Professor Sir Jim Macdonald chaired a meeting of the Scottish Energy Advisory Board and proposed to its members a new approach to energy and a better deal for Scotland. I'm pleased to say that there was a very clear consensus in that meeting over the priorities of a new energy strategy for Scotland. Three things must be achieved. First, a stable managed energy transition, ensuring Scotland has a secure and affordable energy supplies in future decades as we address the need to decarbonise our energy system in line with this Parliament's Climate Change Act. Uh, where the Scottish Government continues to support the innovation and expertise from our oil and gas industry, the deployment of renewable energy technologies, and the development of more innovative and low-cost ways of producing, storing, and transmitting energy. Second, taking a whole system view of the challenge, by which I mean consideration of Scotland's energy supply and energy consumption as equal priorities and building a genuinely integrated approach to power, transport and heat. Our success rests on continuing our good work to make our homes, workplaces and vehicles more energy efficient and more affordable to run. Third, embracing a truly local vision of energy provision for Scotland, promoting local energy solutions planned with community involvement and offering community ownership of energy generation, delivering a lasting economic asset to communities in every part of Scotland. Developing our new energy strategy is an ambitious program, but we have many of the building blocks in place. If re-elected by the people of Scotland in May, we will then set out more detail about the new approach and a draft energy strategy will be published for consultation by the end of this year to accompany the draft third report on policies and proposals required by the Climate Change Act which will set out how Scotland can achieve future emissions reduction targets. In formulating the draft energy strategy for Scotland, we will draw on the expertise of Scotland's industrial and academic communities. We shall also embark upon a public dialogue with Scottish communities and energy consumers over their energy future. As I set out the plans to develop a new energy strategy, I would like to briefly reflect on the Scottish Government's commitment to developing a thriving renewable energy sector in Scotland in partnership with industry, development agencies and academia, which has led to major changes in energy provision in recent years. Almost 50% of domestic demand for electricity is now met by renewables. That's up from around 10% only 10 years ago. Scotland has already met the 220 target to install 500 megawatts of community and locally owned renewable generation capacity. The development of onshore wind in the right places has underpinned investment in grid upgrades, upgrades which will enable us to develop our offshore and marine potential. Projects such as SSE's Beatrice Offshore Wind Farm, which subject to final investment decision approval, will become the largest infrastructure project in Scotland, 2.5 billion. With substantial Scottish Government support, we are on the cusp of two record-breaking projects. 
Magen, the world's largest tidal stream array, being developed in the Pentland Firth, with the first four turbines being installed this year. And the next stage of High Wind, the world's largest floating offshore wind project, being in place uh, by 2018. We should celebrate these successes, presiding officer, but I'm sorry to say that we now face stiff headwinds to continued progress across the full range of Scottish energy priorities. Indecision and inconsistency in energy policy from Westminster is now placing Scottish investment and jobs at risk. UK government inaction continues to threaten the prosperity of the oil and gas industry. We are using our devolved powers to provide support where possible, but I have repeatedly called on the UK government to do more with its powers over the fiscal regime and non-tax measures, such as loan guarantees to support the industry and its highly skilled workforce. I await tomorrow's budget uh, with eager anticipation. We face an onslaught from the UK government against renewables. In its abrupt and irrational termination of financial support for the best value technologies, placing Scottish jobs and investment at risk and jeopardising further progress towards our 220 renewable energy targets. The UK Government has in effect chosen nuclear power over carbon capture and storage with an abrupt cancellation of the CCS demonstrator competition, which could have done so much for Peter Head. Scottish energy consumers, all of our constituents, now face unprecedented risks to the basic tenets of energy provision, secure energy supplies at the best price. Power station closures across Britain continue, including Longanet, which will close in the next fortnight without the prospect of replacement. The Competition and Market Authority confirmed last week that consumers are still not getting a fair deal. And in a further blow, the UK government has halved the value of the support available to help the most vulnerable in society heat their homes more affordably. Scotland cannot wait for DEC and the Treasury, presiding officer, to get it right. It would be easier for me to stand here and talk about our intentions for the next parliament, but these issues are too important to wait. We are now acting with some of the programmes that begin to address these challenges. <clears throat> the Scottish Energy Efficiency Programme, following Cabinet's agreement that energy efficiency should be a national infrastructure priority, will provide an offer of support to buildings across Scotland, domestic and non-domestic, to improve their energy efficiency rating over a 15 to 20 year period. Building upon the success of existing programmes that since 2009 have delivered over half a billion pounds to improve energy efficiency and tackle fuel poverty. A new energy efficiency procurement framework developed with Scottish Futures Trust to improve the public sector's energy efficiency to the tune of £300 million. On Local Energy Challenge Fund, which last week awarded up to £10 million of funding to nine new projects, all of which explore a new kind of localised energy provision with innovative technologies and community involvement. And today I'm announcing a further £7 million for investment in district heating for the next financial year. This will bring... This will bring our total investment into district heating to over £17 million. There is so much economic opportunity and societal benefit for Scotland in this new approach and securing the benefits must be a shared endeavour. I hope I can rely on the support of members as this important work to develop Scotland's energy strategy progresses. Thank you, Minister. The Minister will now take questions. Sarah Boyock. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Minister for advance notice of his statement and welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to produce an energy strategy, although we are disappointed it's taken so long. We're also disappointed that the Scottish Government's budget saw cuts in renewables and energy efficiency, given the failure to meet our first climate four climate change targets and the fact that we won't have eradicated fuel poverty by the November target. Can I, however, agree with the Minister about the short-termism of the Tory government that he referred to, which has created massive uncertainty and job losses, the cancellation of carbon capture and storage projects, the fact that they have put renewables into reverse, cutting green energy to the bone. In advance of tomorrow's budget, will the Minister support Labour's proposal for a new public body 
to invest in North Sea assets, which are strategically important to get us through the current difficult times in the industry? And will the Minister also tell us now whether fracking will be part of the Scottish Government's energy policy later this year? Minister. Well, I, I think I'm able to, to welcome some measure of, of consensus that, that uh, Sarah Boyack mentioned at the beginning. And I, I think we have worked uh, pretty much together in many ways with many of Ms Boyack's colleagues over the past five years, for which I'm grateful. Let me answer the questions as follows. First, we've made very clear our position about unconventionals. Uh, there is a moratorium in place at the moment. There can be no development. It is right, however, that we study these matters on an evidence-based approach. And I think it's fair to say that we have set out extremely detailed plans about what evidence we will take, what will then follow, and we will then have a national debate. So I think that that is, uh, is, is very, clear, uh, very clear indeed. Um, second, I think the specific question was about oil and gas. Um, I wait with interest precisely what the Labour Party proposed, uh, what sum of money is proposed, for whom, investment in what, on what advice, when and how. May I say to Ms Boyack that it does appear to me, and it's appeared to me for quite some time, and this is something that I've put on the record in this chamber, that the immediate, uh, uh, the immediate uh, risk facing the industry is that some operators are under considerable financial pressure, uh, and that the immediate action which is required is for the banks to keep faith with those operators. Uh, that point was well made, I think, by Serene Wood in the last couple of days. I think that's the most immediate issue that requires to be dealt with. Uh, I myself have written to the major banks and I'm in dialogue with them. The purpose of this is to urge them to keep faith with the oil and gas industry over these toughest of times and to avert the risk which is well recognized uh, in the industry and which I've discussed with, uh, with Andy Samuel, the Oil and Gas Authority, uh, Chief Ex Regulator, Chief Authority, uh, that uh, to do so and to see the banks keep faith with the industry is necessary to avoid financial contagion or as it's otherwise known, the domino effect. So I think those were the two questions presiding officer that Ms Boyack raised. Uh, I will check to see if I've missed anything, in which case I will revert to her. Mr. Fraser. Uh, can I thank the Minister for advanced copy of his statement, although his text was rather long on criticising others and remarkably short on many concrete proposals from the Scottish Government policy in this area. The Minister's criticism of UK Government policy sits rather at odds with comments I read in the Herald just two weeks ago from Keith Anderson, Chief Corporate Officer at Scottish Power, who I'm sure the Minister knows well, who announced plans by his company to invest £6.3 billion in renewable energy in the UK over the next five years reflecting, uh, and I quote, the company's confidence in the UK market. And Mr Anderson went on to praise the UK government for providing the stable regulatory environment needed to encourage firms to invest in offshore wind farms, such as the very project at Beatrice that the minister referred to. But in an effort to get some specifics, can I ask uh, the minister two questions? Firstly, now that energy efficiency is a national infrastructure priority, how much of the Scottish government's capital budget will be allocated to this in future years. And secondly, isn't it time that the Minister finally got off the fence on the issue of fracking? He talks a lot about the issue of scientific evidence. The Scottish Government's own expert scientific panel concluded as long ago as July 2014 that fracking could be conducted safely in Scotland if properly controlled and regulated. Why isn't the Scottish Government listening to its own scientists in this respect? Minister. Presiding officer, uh, first of all, presiding officer, could, could I point out that uh, Keith Anderson is not investing in Beatrice? That's an SSE project. It's not Scottish Power. Uh, Scottish Power are, of course, investing in renewable energy. Uh, some of that is in Scotland. Some of that in, in England, with the benefit of contracts uh, for uh, for difference. But Keith Anderson also expressed very clearly that the reason, presiding officer, we are seeing the premature closure of Longanet is that Longanet fa faced, because it operates north of the border and not uh, somewhere like Surrey, additional charges for the cost of transmission uh, in Scotland as opposed to England to the tune of, if I recollect correctly, around about 40 million a year. So I think really, Murdo Fraser, by raising Keith Anderson, makes it very clear 
uh, that his, his point is misconceived because Mr. Anderson said repeatedly that the transmission charging system means that there is a barrier, indeed a blockage, to new thermal plant being built, uh, uh, being built uh, in Scotland, and that's uh, indubitably the case. Mr. Anderson has also pointed out that what the UK needs in the short term to maintain security supply is new combined gas cycle gas turbines, but there's no means of incentivizing that. He wrote an article in the Financial Times making that clear, and the UK government has, uh, I'm afraid, not responded to that in any meaningful way. Turning to the two questions, we will consider very carefully how we use every means of our disposal to, to further the aims of a whole systems approach, uh, a managed transition, uh, and more local energy provision uh, with community involvement. Obviously, we, we have to consult on this, as I think is right, uh, but I mentioned already the £300 million investment in the public estate, presiding officer. I could mention the £50 million of the CARES project over the last uh, CARES scheme over the last two years, uh, more than the, the whole of the amount invested in community schemes south of the border. Uh, or I could, invest, I could refer to the continued investment of funds from the Renewable Energy Investment Fund, which have been used for, uh, to, to, to good effect. Uh, secondly, uh, with regard to the unconventional gas question, the answer is exactly the same as it is before. Uh, a, un, unlike that side, where they are gung-ho for fracking, that side where somewhat belatedly, and contrary to the position down south, they've come out against it, we think that we should take a moderate approach based on analysing the evidence and thereafter having a debate and coming up with, with a conclusion after involvement with and consultation of all of the people of Scotland. And if I may make one further point, presiding officer, I suspect that quite a lot of people in our electorate, the people of Scotland, would like to know a bit more about the issue. They may not know enough about the issue, and therefore providing them with evidence about the issue is an extremely valuable and necessary process if we wish to have a rational debate, which of course in Scotland we do. Mark MacDonald, followed by Claire Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Minister mentioned in his speech um, the vision of uh, local involvement and community involvement. Does he see uh, opportunity as a consequence of the community empowerment legislation for much greater community ownership and involvement in terms of renewable energy provision within their area? Minister. Uh, yes, I do. And we, we have reached our target of 500 megawatts by, by 2000. And 20. I mean, let me give you a practical example. Uh, in the, the Western Isles Point in Sandwick is the largest wholly owned community wind project at nine megawatts. The revenue from this project is one million pounds a year. What a tremendous contribution to communities for future generations, presiding officer. One million pounds a year. What a tremendous achievement. So, of course, to answer Mr. McDonald's question, of course, uh, we want to see the opportunities of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act, which encourages and supports enterprising community development, maximised. The problem is the abrupt and savage cuts by the UK government to the FITS tariffs make this project much more difficult. That, presiding officer, in conclusion, was a very, very clear message from the Community Energy Cares Conference at which I spoke uh, earlier today. Claudia Beamish, followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister will rightly draw on expertise and have public dialogue in formulating the energy strategy, but he fails to reference unions in his statement. Why is this? And surely the strategy needs to come as a result of the RPP3, not to accompany it, to address the future emissions in a targeted and effective way. Minister. <coughs> Uh, well, we, we routinely, of course, engage with trade unions. I didn't mention bosses either, actually. I mean, I, I can't mention absolutely everybody, but of course we shall engage with trade unions. I actually met, uh, a, I can inform Claudia Beamish, with, uh, for example, several of the uh, senior union representatives representing the oil and gas industry just a couple of weeks ago. We, I meet with them at least twice a year, uh, and that's because we want to learn what they have to say about how we can best shape our policy uh, on matters such as oil and gas, and to great effect because it's the people that work in the industry that very often know how better to do things more efficiently. Uh, and indeed, some of the enlightened uh, companies in the sector have already used that to best effect. So, of course, we will fully consult the trade unions, and I'm very happy to give the assurance to that effect to Claudia Beamish and other members. 
Liam MacArthur, followed by Roderick Campbell. Thank you very much, President Officer. Can I too thank the Minister for advance <coughs> sight of his statement and welcome plans to develop a revised energy strategy, particularly uh, an approach that integrates power on which I think good progress has been made by successive administrations since 1999, with transport and heat where a great deal more needs to be done. In that respect, I'd be grateful for more detail on how the £7 million will be used to support district heating projects, such as the one in Shetland, where I understand infrastructure remains a stumbling block. And sticking with infrastructure, while I agree that confidence in the renewable sector has nosedived since my colleague Ed Davey left office and the Conservatives were left to their own devices, can the Minister outline what the next steps are for securing grid connections to Orkney and the other island groups that are essential if we are to harness our full potential in terms of wind, wave and tidal resources? Minister. Well, I'm happy to, to write to Mr MacArthur with, uh, uh, with details uh, with regards to the expenditure of the seven million in, in due course. The announcement has just been made and I will furnish him with the details. Regarding his second question, um, I recently I had the opportunity to discuss at the Convention of Highlands and Islands last Monday, in fact, uh, with representatives from uh, the uh, a island, uh, Orkney Island Council, Stephen, Stephen Heddle and colleagues were represented, uh, just this, this very issue. Um, as Mr MacArthur knows, it is my top priority to connect the islands of Scotland to the grid. And the reason for that is the tremendous benefits to the people in the islands, in Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles, uh, that connecting to the UK grid would have. Those benefits were estimated by the Beringa report, uh, if I remember correctly, to amount to £725 million. Uh, Mr MacArthur and I have worked on this for some time. These benefits would be game-changing. Now, we are concerned, and the concerns were expressed at COHE, that the UK government, although Andrea Leadsom told us uh, last September, that the process of obtaining EU approval for the state aid uh, procedure would take two months. They still haven't put the application in, even although our understanding is the application is put in after the substance has been agreed. Uh, and therefore, we're extremely concerned that the UK government uh, 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 has not taken the necessary steps to make progress with the island connections. And we are, of course, pressing them on this very point. Rod Campbell, followed by Chick Brody. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister advise how uh, biomass energy centres, such as the new biomass plant in Garbridge in my constituency, help the Scottish Government to meet the targets set out in the new energy strategy? And can he also uh, clarify the Government's position on independent emissions monitoring of such centres? Minister. Uh, well, I, I have had the, the benefit of visiting the, the Garbridge uh, a development uh, a, and uh, discussing it with the, a, with the colleagues, in, including St Andrews University. The, uh, the Spruce funding, which is an innovative funding model, uh, was provided of £11 million for what is a very important development that will transform the energy provision in St Andrews University. It's a, it's a terrific uh, uh, project. It will deliver enormous uh, benefits, and I've been very pleased to work closely with uh, the university and others to deliver that. Uh, and obviously, uh, we do believe that these uh, projects can make a, a, a very substantial s contribution towards uh, emission reduction. Uh, and of course, that, that is one which we will wish to analyze very carefully uh, once the development, of course, uh, a, a itself is installed. Chick Brody, followed by Eileen Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I welcome the whole range of planned energy initiatives provided by the Minister today, particularly those on energy efficiency. <clears throat> Given the possibility that EDF is facing major difficulty in obtaining the funding to progress the Hinkley Point nuclear facility, can the Minister advise what discussions he has had with the Westminster Government, with DEC and the National Grid regarding imminent security of supply? Isn't it the case that recent funding actions and strategic decisions made by the UK government regarding renewables in Scotland, Peterhead and Long Annet smack more of petty post-referendum reactions and, little, and have little meaning for a thriving, stable and secure electricity supply? Minister. Signing uh, officer, uh, to answer the question, I, I have uh, uh, raised extensively with the UK government our concerns 
that their energy policy is putting security of supply of electricity in the UK at serious risk. We have raised this, uh, and I have raised this, with Ed Davey, with Amber Rudd. The First Minister raised this with the Prime Minister in a letter urging him to intervene uh, in respect of averting the premature closure of Long Gannett. The Prime Minister, I'm afraid, would not lift a finger. He alluded in justifying his uh, inertia to the stance taken by National Grid. At that point, National Grid uh, had, I think, a very optimistic view about what was going to happen on the grid. I argued to the National Grid that coal-fired power station was going to come off more quickly than they had anticipated. Presiding officer, the power stations that uh, are going to be closing reasonably soon include not only Long Gannett, but Fiddler's Ferry, Rugley, Eggborough, and Ferry Bridge, uh, amounting to around about 15% of peak GB energy demand. Uh, we believe this is a very serious issue and that the UK's approach of a new nuclear power station sometime towards the end of the next decade, frankly, just does not cut the mustard. Eileen Murray, followed by Rob Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In his speech, the Minister mentioned grid upgrade. He may be aware that Scottish Power Energy Networks uh, proposed a Bewley Denny style pylon network across uh, Dumfries and Galloway, which local pe people, to a person as far as I've been uh, made aware, consider would benefit large multinational power generation companies and not the local economy. Will the Minister assure my constituents that when considering any planning application for a new transmission line in the region, the Scottish Government will give top priority to consideration of factors such as landscape, environment and tourism and encourage underground and undersea cabling where possible. Minister. Well, well I, I, I think I, I, I can only say in response to Elaine Murray's question that in determining any application under Section 36, as Minister, uh, I have to act uh, in accordance with the procedure set out, consider every application on its merits and consider it safely. I think it would be wrong for me now to ascribe uh, weight or, uh, uh, or importance to some criteria over others, but I can assure the member who has raised this issue with me as a constituency MSP uh, that uh, I will of course look at this uh, very carefully. But I just make the point to, conclu to conclude, presiding officer, we can't have more energy schemes, renewable or otherwise, unless we have the good connections. It's precisely because of the robust approach that we have taken and the support for onshore wind that we're now seeing the possibility of wave and tidal energy. It wouldn't be happening unless we had Bewley Denny, nor would Beatrice. This is all one of a piece. You cannot pick and mix. And therefore, grid upgrades are part of the necessary process in seeing Scotland realise her renewable potential. Rob Gibson, followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you, President Officer. Given the urgent need to better serve Scottish consumers with clean power and the Minister's uh, welcome of the deployment of the high wind floating turbines off Aberdeenshire by 2018, would the Minister uh, give us an update on uh, the large deployment of these uh, um, floating structures? Uh, would they take less time to build? Would they be less expensive than seafloor based offshore wind turbines, for example, in areas like the Pentland Firth and the Murray Firth? Minister. Uh, Scotland is about to have two world firsts. Uh, the first largest tidal stream uh, in the Pentland Firth by Atlantis Maygen, uh, and the first largest uh, floating offshore uh, array by Statoil uh, off the northeast coast of Scotland. Uh, to respond to a specific question uh, in relation to the floating offshore, research from the Carbon Trust suggests that this concepts could potentially reduce generating costs to below £100 per megawatt hour, with larger concepts producing even lower costs by the mid-20s. Floating offshore also can be deployed where the best wind conditions exist and different wind directions from fixed uh, offshore wind developments, thereby being able to access the market at a more commercially suitable time. So the potential, in conclusion, presiding officer, uh, which Mr. Gibson rightly signals, is that offshore, floating offshore and others offer the potential through substantial cost reduction to provide excellent solutions, renewable low carbon solutions for our electricity provision over the next several decades. Patrick Harvey followed finally by Stuart Stevenson. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. When I saw that we were going to have a statement on a new energy strategy for Scotland, silly me, I assumed that we were going to hear some detail about what was going to be in it. Uh, nevertheless, I thank the Minister for the advanced copy of the statement, which tells us once again that he thinks there ought to be one in the future. He tells us it would be easy for me to stand here and talk about our intentions for the next Parliament. I have to say I rather wish he had. Can he tell us this? If reducing energy consumption is going to have the equal prominence alongside supply that he says it should have, when is the right time to stop cutting the budgets that perform that work? How much more do we need to spend than is in the current Scottish budget? And uh, you know, when, is, when, it, when can we begin to see the, the idea of a national infrastructure priority being taken seriously? Or does he think this can all be done by wishing? Minister. Well, um, I naively thought, presenting also, that Mr. Harvey would welcome the new approach that we focus on how we can use energy more efficiently. I thought he would welcome the approach of cutting energy demand. I thought that was one of the basic tenets of the Green Party since it was founded, to use less energy and to use it better. Uh, uh, and and uh, uh, therefore, the cynical, negative and point scoring contribution that he's made this afternoon seems to me not to advance us one jot. I thought he would wel welcome the emphasis on heat as well as light. I thought he would be pleased that we're going to be focusing on transport. But all of this, all in the statement, all mentioned, uh, he apparently missed. Nonetheless, in the spirit of goodwill to all men, I do hope that in the open, transparent process of dialogue that we will adopt in developing this strategy, we will have the benefit of Mr. Harvey's detailed thoughts. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, can the Minister confirm that it's the Government's view that the proximity of the North East of Scotland and Peterhead in particular uh, to emptied uh, oil basins creates not only a domestic opportunity for storage of CO2, but an international opportunity to take other people's CO2, and in particular, the engineering expertise in the North East is something that I would like to hear from him if he's uh, had any positive indications of any kind that tomorrow's budget might help provide employment as well as addressing climate change. Minister. Uh, well, I, I haven't heard from Mr. Osborne of any indications, positive or otherwise, uh, but Mr. Stewart, Mr. Stevenson is absolutely right that, that uh, the opportunity to use depleted oil and gas fields uh, uh, off uh, Scotland's shores and off England's shores uh, is an enormous opportunity both uh, for the environment and for the oil and gas industry. For the environment because, as the International Energy Authority has often said, in order to cut our emissions and meet climate change targets, carbon capture and storage is a necessity. It can't be done without it, which makes the Greens' uh, refusal to support this policy uh, some, somewhat astonishing. Uh, and secondly, regarding the engineering point, the engineering expertise which was encompassed and possessed an SSE Shell partnership and the CCS project, which the UK government unilaterally and abruptly scrapped, uh, was of an international variety. Uh, and the people involved whom I met in a visit to Peter Head, a half day visit, were hugely looking forward to it. There was a spring in their step. They were looking forward to Scotland and Britain being in the lead in the world in this project. And all of that was scrapped in a moment by a short-sighted venal decision by the UK government. That ends the statement from the Minister. We now, Patrick Harvey, is this a point of order? Point of order. I'm grateful, Presiding Officer, and I know that there are certain words which we are not expected to use about other members in the Chamber. I certainly don't want to break that rule. But just for clarity, in responding to that last point, uh, was Fergus Ewing stretching the truth beyond breaking point in misrepresenting the Greens' position? And would that be a legitimate way to describe his position rather than words which we're not expected to use? The member is well aware that there was no one parliamentary language used and that any language that is used in the chamber in response to questions is entirely a matter for the member himself. I always expect all members to treat each other with courtesy and respect, and I sincerely hope in the next two weeks that everybody in this chamber will do so. The next item of business is a debate on motion number.